Hi. Today I want to take a look at another method of calculating the enthalpy change of a reaction, applying something called Hess's Law. His law states that the enthalpy change of a reaction is independent of its path, provided the initial and final states are the same. So let's look at how that we can interpret this. <clears throat> Here I have a reaction, and I would like to figure out what the enthalpy change for this reaction is. This is the initial state of my system. Now the word state here goes beyond just solid, liquid, or gas. It means that the species and number of species are the same as well as temperature and pressure and, of course, the state. The final state I want to finish up is with this chemical also at this temperature, uh, sorry, at standard temperature and also a gas. If I can find another way to go from here to here, according to Hess, I can add up their heats and predict this enthalpy change. So I'm going to use these equations down below to do that by in a technique called equation rearrangement. So let's start here with my initial state. As I scan these two equations down below, I notice the presence of nitrogen dioxide in this equation. So I'm going to start with this one. Now the first thing that I notice is here it's a product. In order for it to match this one, I need to make it a reactant. I don't need this reaction. I need the reverse reaction. So if you think about it for a moment, delta H for this reaction is negative 57. That means it's an exothermic reaction. That means we can think of the 57 kilojoules as being over on this side. If I take this reaction and drive it in the other direction and make it happen this way, heat then becomes a requirement and the heat for this reaction then becomes that of an endothermic reaction. So I'm going to rearrange this equation, turning it around first of all. So it's going to become nitrogen dioxide forming oxygen gas and a half a nitrogen gas. And the enthalpy change now for this reaction, the reverse one, will become positive 57 kilojoules. Now, I now have this species on the correct side, and it's also a gas, and this is also measured at standard conditions. But the other problem I have right now is there's two of them, so I need to double this equation. And that also requires doubling this heat. Now I'm going to take a look at the final state. This substance and this equation, they match each other. They are both products of the reaction. They're both gases, and they're both required at standard conditions. So I can leave this equation the way it is. So 2O2. Um, plus N2 makes N2O4. And as I said, I'm going to leave that enthalpy change the way it is at plus 9. Now, here I'm going to add these two equations together because what I want to prove is that doing the reaction in two steps, an indirect path, this step followed by this step, I essentially arrive and finish at the same state. So by adding these two together, let's see what we get. Well, the first thing I'm going to notice on opposite sides of this arrow are the two oxygens and the two oxygens. And again, on opposite sides, one nitrogen, one nitrogen. So when I add these together, I get this for my starting state and this for my final state, which is an exact match for the equation that I desire. So making this reaction happen in two steps, an alternative path, is the same as this. Hence, I can add their heats together and I get 123 kilojoules. So that would be the enthalpy change for this reaction. I'm just going to show that represented another way in a, an energy diagram here. What I'm saying then is if I you know, roll it down, I still need, if I start my reaction with 
2NO2, this material, and if I add to it 2 times 57 kilojoules, I will end up here with 2 oxygen gas and nitrogen gas. Then in the next step, I take that material and convert it into my dinitrogen tetroxide. And that step requires a further 9 kilojoules. So I'm starting here, finishing here. I can get the heat from this reaction now from here up to here. And that's 123, and it's positive kilojoules. So this is just another way of showing what I've done here, breaking the reaction down into two steps instead of one direct path. Now, I'm going to try to solve the problem, a second method here, using something called an enthalpy cycle. So again, here's the equation I want to start and finish with, and this is what I'm told. Let's begin by taking this information and presenting it in this diagram. So if I take two oxygen gas and a nitrogen gas, I know that I can convert it into that substance, and that requires nine kilojoules of energy. Now, in the equation down below, I know I can take these same two substances and turn them into nitrogen dioxide. Now, that's negative 57 kilojoules to do that. Now, the other thing is I've had to double these amounts to arrive here, so I'm going to double the heat. So I've now presented my given information in this diagram. I want the heat for this direct path. Well, that would be the same as going down here, this way, and then going from here up to here. This would be an alternative path. Now, the first thing I notice is this arrow and this arrow are going in the same direction, so I can leave this alone. However, I want to go in the opposite direction to the given information I'm told here. So what that requires, then, is changing this information. So if I want to go in the other direction, this would be 2 times positive 57 kilojoules. And so going here and going here, I can then say, okay, the heat for my unknown reaction is exactly the same as going this alternative path, 2 times 57 plus the 9, and I arrive at the same answer 123 kilojoules. So you should be well versed in both methods, interpreting an enthalpy cycle diagram to find out the heat of a reaction, or using equation rearrangement to arrive at the heat for a reaction or enthalpy change. In our, last pro in our second last program, we'll take a look at the use of heats of formation to determine the enthalpy change of a reaction. Thanks for watching.